Alex Riss, who's Head of Trauma um, at the Royal London and a Limb Recon Consultant. We've got uh, Mr. Alexi Iliadis, who again is a Limb Recon Consultant. And we've got Miss Isabel Citron, who is a Senior Registrar in, Ortho um, in Plastics, sorry. Uh, so I'm gonna hand over to Alexi. Uh, so enjoy, and um, I'll see you soon. So, Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome and uh, thank you for joining us in this talk today. Um, so, especially in view of the football, we'll try and uh, keep this uh, as uh, brief as possible. So, first of all, my name is Alex Iliadis. I'm one of the consultants in Lumber Construction at the Royal London, and part of the work that we do has to do a lot with bone infection. Uh, and I think if you're going to take one thing back from this teaching today, I want you to all really think that, you know, bone infection is probably one of the most challenging situations. Uh, it is quite a difficult thing to deal with. And through this talk today, we'll just uh, try and present you with all these things that we think are important for you to know, particularly at an early stage in your orthopedic career. Next, please. So I say it's... Uh, a big problem and it's quite a common problem. So we see that, you know, in approximately one to 2% uh, of fractures fixed with metal work. Uh, we see it quite a lot uh, in open fractures, historically up to 50% of the grade three Bustillo uh, fractures uh, were getting infections. And even today where we have moved towards um, a much more centralized service with the advent of uh, MTCs, we still see units reporting up to 25%. Once you have an infection, it's quite difficult to deal with. Even with the, our best efforts, you'll see recurrence rates of up to 10%. A lot of these patients, unfortunately, through a prolonged course of treatment and failures will end up with an amputation. In all of them, there is a, a lot of uh, uh, reoperations as well as increased length of stay. And there's papers recently reporting that the cost of care of these patients uh, can be up to six to seven times more than the initial expected costs. And that's particularly important, especially in view of how the NHS operates uh, these days and how resources are allocated. So we'll also talk today from a soft tissue perspective of infection about necrotizing fasciitis. It still continues to have an extremely high mortality rate. And certainly we can tell that time to surgery is one of the biggest correlates when it comes to your outcomes of this. So we we'll want you by the end of this to at least be able to think about it, think what you need to do and what your first kind of course of action should be. So the topics we'll cover today is mostly related to osteomyelitis. We'll talk about acute and chronic osteomyelitis and we'll talk about the concept of fracture related infection, which is uh, something which is particularly hot these days with a lot of work being done, a lot of publications, a lot of research on the topic. Today, we will not particularly focus on joint infection. The principles of managing joint infection are quite similar, uh, but when it comes particularly to prosthetic infections, this should be covered in the topics of arthroplasty. And our plastic colleague will also speak to us today about the soft tissue aspect of infection uh, as we encounter it in orthopedics. So the topics covered today, we'll try and go through the definitions and pathophysiology. We'll try and give you some um, tools to address uh, these uh, cases when you see them. How do you go about your initial assessment? What are your sort of diagnostic tools, your armamentarium of dealing with infection? What are your management principles? Uh, we'll discuss a case just to highlight all these things and put them all into context. And then we'll invite some questions and uh, obviously be out by eight o'clock for kickoff. So just some very simple definitions. And I think this is probably, you know, the early part of a talk where there is some kind of theory that we have to uh, explain to you. But I think it's really important to understand what you're dealing with in the first place. So when you're talking about osteomyelitis, you're talking about an inflammation essentially of the bone and the bone marrow, as in an osteitis being a bone inflammation. And that does not necessarily mean, that does not imply an infective cause as such, but in the very vast majority of cases, there is an infective cause. Um, therefore, we have come in orthopedics to define osteomyelitis basically as an infection of a bone, which is characterized by the progressive inflammatory destruction and the new bone apposition. In a similar way, uh, next please, when it comes to the soft tissues, uh, we have cellulitis, which we know as an inflammation of dermis and subcutaneous tissues. 
and necrotizing fasciitis, which we'll talk about later, which is more of a rapidly progressing infection of the fascia with secondary necrosis of the surrounding tissues. Now, when it comes to osteomyelitis, uh, I, I don't like uh, war uh, quotes, but uh, when you're dealing with infection, you are literally fighting against the bugs. And it's really, really important to be able to understand what you're fighting against and what you're trying to achieve. And it's only through that that you'll increase your chances of actually getting a successful outcome. You know, sometimes you can be lucky always, uh, but really when you're managing a situation like that, you want to have as much information as possible and actually be able to really target your treatment to what you need to address. So there are certain terms that are quite commonly used, and these are terms that people need to be very clear on with and very familiar with. So sequestrum, essentially, to put it simply, it's a bit of dead bone inside the bone. It's a, in an area where your blood supply doesn't reach, therefore your antibiotics don't reach. And that's where infection can lie dormant for a long time. That can be your nidus where infection kind of recurs. Another term quite often used when you're dealing with osteomyelitis is your involucrum. And as we'll see when we discuss the pathophysiology of osteomyelitis, this is essentially your own body's response, trying to heal following the insult from the infection and the accompanying inflammatory response. Following that, you have the cloaca, which is essentially a hole through the bone, through where the inflammatory products are discharged to the surface of the bone that can lead to a subperiosteal collection or that can further track towards the skin and create a sinus, which is the infected track uh, from the deep-seated infection discharging to the surface. And this is an X-ray just demonstrating the presence of all these signs in osteomyelitis. Of course, the case is not always uh, so straightforward and you're not often presented with all this. Now, this slide is really about the basic pathophysiology. And again, it comes to really understanding what you're trying to deal with. So, you get an infective source, and that can be sort of direct inoculation when you're dealing with open fractures. It can be hematogenous spread, but that can seed at any part of the bone. Once that seeds there, you've got the uh, bacteria or the bugs basically uh, attacking the surface proteins, deactivating the host defense mechanisms, creating an intense inflammatory response that brings about vasoconstriction, clotting, you get reduced blood supply in the area, you get necrosis, you get propagation of the infection, you get inability to address that infection by your own body's defense mechanisms. That also all stimulates an osteolytic response, so you get bone loss, and then again, your own body responds to that by trying to form new bone to contain that as well as to provide stability. So this is how all these signs that we talked about earlier come about through the pathophysiological process. And understanding this is vital. Another, well, last important thing in terms of pathophysiology that is important to understand is the concept of biofilm. We talk very often about biofilm, um, and it's important to understand that this has two main issues that uh, affect your management. So first of all, when you go your bacteria in a planktonic state, they're quite metabolically active, and as a result, they're quite responsive to antibiotics. Now, once they start forming microcolonies, they form this kind of glycocalyx layer, this slime layer, and that can be on bone surfaces, but that has a particular preference for metal. Once you get that biofilm forming, then you're faced with two problems with regards to how you can treat infection, because not only you have the biofilm preventing the antibiotics getting to the bugs themselves, but at the same time, the bacteria enter this sessile state where basically they're very metabolically inactive. And as a result, again, they're not responding to the antibiotics that you give. So we'll talk about the role of biofilm later on when we talk about the surgical management and the importance of addressing it. Now, we talk about classifications in osteomyelitis and the most common one that uh, people will um, quote is the one acute versus chronic. And people will quote different time periods, but I think the important thing to understand here is that there is no time cutoff of when you define an infection as acute or chronic. It all depends on what stage of that pathophysiological process you are. So as we said earlier on the previous slide with pathophysiology, and you can follow down from A to J, you start with the infection, you get the extension of the infection in the surrounding parts, you get abscesses developing intramedullary or superiosteal, you get stripping, you get bone death, and then you get sequestration formation. And it's really at that stage 
where you start defining osteomyelitis as chronic. Now, another very commonly used classification is the churning major classification. And if someone starts reading about infection, you find that there are various other attempted classifications. But this has really stood the test of time. And the reason is that it takes into consideration two things. It takes into consideration both your anatomical factors as well as your host factors. And it really helps you in deciding what course of treatment you're going to follow. So on the one hand, you have your type one to four which really depend on to whether the infection is contained within the canal, whether the infection is spreading outwards to the canal, and how is that creating a, a path towards outside and how is that affecting the surrounding bone. And then you have the host factor classification, which is another very important thing to consider because when you're treating a patient with this, you're embarking upon quite a prolonged treatment possibly with many surgical procedures, possibly with long courses of antibiotics. And you really wanna decide what it is that you're trying to achieve for your patient. And occasionally you may find that there are aspects of the patient that really make your job quite difficult. So you have to look at the patient, you have to assess for signs of both local pathology and systemic disease. And um, the host uh, C as described by the churning matter is essentially those patients who are actually your intervention is more likely to cause harm to the patient than benefit them. And again, we'll come to this later when we're discussing about management. Now, at this stage, we want to introduce certain questions. So um, we'll want you also to give us uh, some answers to these just to see what people think. So if Sarmi, we could have the first question. So please tell us what you think. In a patient with, with sickle cell disease, what's the most likely pathogen? Uh, how long do we, uh, we give? Uh, we can give it another uh, 10 seconds. Okay. 10 seconds and then we'll launch it. And the answer that comes up is the most popular answer, not necessarily the correct answer, but the most popular answer. Yeah, the most popular, that's what we need. <laughs> All right, I will close the poll now. Brilliant. So a lot of you have answered salmonella and I presume that's uh, because of uh, what the textbooks say about salmonella being a common pathogen in sickle cell disease. That is true, but what is the correct answer is that it's staph aureus. So, you are unlikely to get salmonella in other population groups, but even in the sickle cell population, your staph aureus is going to be your most common pathogen. And overall, your staph aureus is gonna be, in the vast majority of cases, your most common pathogen. So this is just a, a bit of a list. I don't wanna go through all this, but really that just to highlight that in different populations groups with different underlying pathologies, you should be considering the presence of these infections. The management of uh, osteomyelitis, uh, as we'll talk about later, is very much a, a team effort. And you will have no success unless you have a very good microbiology team. And uh, you'll have to go through all this with the microbiology team, really. Uh, okay, so I think we have another question. So yeah, which one is the wrong answer? closing in five seconds. One, okay. Good. <laughs> 
good. Exactly. The overwhelming majority, which I'm very glad uh, for. Now, we'll talk a little bit about the clinical assessment and how do you approach the patient. There is a lot to cover, and I think that a lot of that is stuff that uh, you guys need to really kind of look into and read yourselves, but I'll direct you towards that, right? I think the important thing is that when you're dealing with a patient with infection, you want to get as much as a detailed history as possible. So you want to know what sort of injury this patient had previously, uh, what sort of treatments they had, where they had them, has there been any infection in the past? Uh, again, for that infection, what were the previous growths, what organisms were found, what antibiotics were given, what sort of surgeries they had. You want to know as much as you can for the patient themselves. As we said before, the host factors are very important. So, you know, through your history taking in your examination, you need to cover everything with regards to potential things like immunocompromised, blood supply, um, overall healing of the patient. And then finally, and probably most importantly, you really need to have a very kind of honest and frank discussion with your patient about what do they want to get out of this? So, you know, you need to establish what is their functional levels, uh, not just now before the infection, but before their injury. What are they trying to achieve? And, you know, what are they wish to undergo? Um, we have a lot of uh, management options, but not everyone wants to undergo that. So, that will also affect, you know, what sort of management you'll follow that. Now, when it comes to your examination, there are certain particular things that you need to look at. Um, if we go to the next slide, again, you know, this is just to highlight that, you know, most people, if they see the picture on the left, they will feel the urge to act and that's totally appropriate. But I think that, you know, what I see still in practice, even with senior colleagues, is that the picture on the right is something that will have a very variable response. So, you know, some of us may get very excited about this, but there's a lot of other people who uh, will occasionally be, uh, well, should I say complacent with that? So, you know, people will say, oh, you know, maybe it's too early, maybe it needs some better dressings, maybe the patient has been on collecting. Yes, maybe all these things, but maybe also this is an infection. So. Again, I think when it comes to your clinical assessment, the most important thing is, as we said before, have a high index of suspicion. And if something doesn't feel right, don't ignore it. Don't give some moral antibiotics and see the patient back in a couple of weeks. Escalate that. If you're not sure, ask someone senior. Get someone else to have a look with a kind of clear you know, head and uh, give their input into that. Now, as we said uh, before, there are many uh, diagnostic uh, uh, options with regards to how you go forward. And again, we'll pass on to another question. So this is just looking at all your options. And the question essentially is, if you had to diagnose osteomyelitis and you only had one uh, imaging modality to choose from, which one would you use? Very well. So yeah, uh, essentially the most the, the best uh, one we have available is the um, MRI with contrast, gadolinium. Uh, usually, it's not enough to uh, to have one, only one imaging modality. Uh, sorry, because uh, or one way to diagnose osteomyelitis. Usually, it's a combination of many positive tests, uh, examinations, and and uh, imaging modalities. Uh, your blood tests are useful for monitoring to see the trends, and uh, you, uh, but you can still have osteomyelitis with normal bloods. Um, uh, Alexia, I think that's uh, your gig and I took over, right? <laughs> Sorry yeah, for that. That's okay, that's okay. But I think, guys, one thing that we'd all like you to do following this uh, teaching is to go on to your post guidelines. And you may very well be aware that recently there's been a post guidelines with regards to fracture related infection. And I think that should be your sort of go to guide when you're dealing with infection, especially in the very beginning when you're not sure of how to approach it. 
So I'll leave that all to, for, uh, to you. Um, yeah, but this is something that uh, we wanted you all to have a look at. So yeah, as we were saying, there are a lot of ways to image osteomyelitis and they're all uh, important and um, they give us useful information, but usually the MRI is the only one that will give us a definitive diagnosis. In simple x-rays, you'll see the sequestrum, if it's there, the involucrum. So you'll see the dead bone inside, the healthy bone growing uh, outside. You'll see the fracture and what happened uh, before the fracture. And you'll also uh, monitor any, any changes. Um, the MRI will show you the soft tissue reaction, abscesses, uh, inflammation in the muscle, it might show you, show you sinuses, and will also show you the marrow reaction in the bone. Usually it exaggerates the marrow reaction a little bit. So if the bone is healthy, it can still give positive signs in, in the MRI. But uh, the, the, the combination of bone and soft tissue imaging is really, really important. Uh, the CD scan is really good for surgical planning because uh, it is not affected from metal work as much as the MRI. It will show you dead pieces of bone. It will show you exactly where your implants are in relation to the infected area. And it will guide your incisions. It will guide the need for metalwork removal or not. And it helps a lot with surgery. And uh, help you decide how much bone you will need to excise. And there are more expensive and complex uh, uh, modalities like bone scans. Uh, some of them, you know, white blood uh, or uh, white cell uh, label scans. You can have indium, technetium scans. You can have spec CTs that combine bone scans with CT scans. They're all really good, especially for surgical planning. The problem with those scans is that they can be false positive in many situations. So uh, uh, let's say for a simple bone scan, uh, a healing fracture will give you more or less the same image as osteomyelitis. So you won't know if that's callus formation or osteomyelitis. The best one of the scans, of the bone scans, uh, is the white cell uh, label scan. Uh, and then you have uh, microbiology. Uh, generally, we don't like wound swabs. And the reason for that, so you have an ab, a patient in clinic with an abscess, a draining sinus, uh, and you're very tempted to take wound swabs. The problem is that you grow so much skin flora and bacteria that are not actually causing the infection, they're just there. They would grow in any healthy patient uh, and uh, they will not be helpful in guiding your treatment you'll still have to give broad spectrum antibiotics which you would give anyway if you didn't know what was growing so the gold standard is deep samples taken with different instruments uh, and sent to the lab at least five of them because usually one positive sample doesn't say much but if you have the same bug growing from three or four that's more diagnostic if you take samples, it's good to keep the patient off antibiotics for a few days before. There's no number for it. There's no golden number. But the more you can safely keep the patient off antibiotics, uh, the more reliable your samples will be and the less false negative results you'll have. Now, if the patient is septic, of course, you'll protect them with antibiotics. But if you can afford to not give antibiotics, you won't give them. Uh, and then we have... Uh, DNA molecular tests, you can have sonication that takes the biofilm off uh, metalwork. And uh, um, always remember that it's good to send uh, samples for histology because uh, infections like tuberculosis, for example, won't give you positive samples, but they will give you very distinct um, histopathology findings. And that's, I think that's the next question now. Um, I think that's, it's time for the next question, right? So treatment of osteomyelitis, would you consider conservative treatment in any of those patients? Actually, which patient would you not treat conservatively? <laughs> 
So let me go through the answers. I think you got it right, most of you, but just 30%. Uh, it's enough to win an election, but uh, we're treating patients now. So children, you can treat conservatively most of the times. And the reason is that, first of all, the, the infection is usually hematogenous and it's not related to dead bone implants and all that. So antibiotics and the immune system will reach the source of the infection and can successfully treat it. Uh, spinal uh, tuberculosis responds well to antibiotics only. Um, vertebral osteomyelitis, uh, it's very hard to treat it surgically because if you remove uh, a vertebra, the um, adverse effects of this are obvious and the instability causes it's, it's more, causes more morbidity than the actual infection. Uh, three months after uh, an internal fixation with a draining sinus is a definite, definite indication for, for treating that surgically. But an early post-operative swelling and erythema, early signs of query infection, you can give it a go with antibiotics. You don't have to be too aggressive, especially if the patient is healthy uh, and uh, you're not sure about the diagnosis. Now, yeah, this is in a nutshell. These are the indications for um, uh, conservative treatment of osteomyelitis. Don't forget that sometimes the C-type host, the host where the treatment is worse than the actual condition, like a 75-year-old with his whole tibia infected, where you had to resect to 15 centimeters of bone, actually is not something you want to put your patient through. The patient might have a draining sinus for life, and have antibiotics when it flares up, and it should be fine. Um, always, an orthopedic surgeon on his own, on her own, uh, is not enough to treat infection. You need help from plastics to get soft tissue cover, vascular surgery to assess the vascularity of the limb and whether it can be improved. Uh, an anesthetist will uh, help you with a difficult uh, patient with uh, complex health issues. Physicians and microbiologists will guide your, your antibiotic treatment and optimize the patient. Radiologists will help you uh, identify the source of the infection and the anatomy and may uh, possibly guide your surgical treatment. Histopathology will give you answers when you don't have positive cultures and you need clinical, clinical nurse specialists and prosthetic and rehab specialists to help you with the recovery and the rehabilitation of the patient. Now, uh, these are uh, the principles. And again, you have to look the patient as a whole and treat it as a, as a condition and a, a journey rather than a, an isolated um, event. Uh, so, um, surgical principles. Uh, could we have the next question, please? Now, there are some golden rules when you're treating bone infection. Uh, which one do you think, based on what we said so far and what you think makes sense, is not one of the basic principles of treating bone infection? Exactly. We need a good debridement. We need to get rid of the dead bone, foreign materials, and anything where a biofilm can grow on. We want to avoid giving antibiotics preoperatively so our samples are reliable. And we need to manage the dead space, stabilize the bones if they're unstable, if you have to excise bone, and provide good soft tissue coverage. Let me go through those things. If you have this situation where a tibia plating or nailing has failed and the skin is passing out, you can see the metal, metal work looking at you. You need to debride everything to healthy bleeding tissue so that antibiotics and the immune system can reach the area and there's no chance of forming a sequestrum uh, 
and also removing all the biofilm, all the areas where and or where the bacteria are protected. Um, good samples, at least five and one for histology. Metalwork removal is key unless, okay. sorry, anyway, unless there is a reason not to remove the metalwork, for example, uh, in the proximal femur, where the morbidity of an unstable proximal femur is too big, you would prefer to remove the metalwork. You can consider exchanging it to something clean. So let's say you're, you have a neck of femur fracture that was got infected with a nail inside it. You can remove the nail, clean everything up and put a fresh new plate on it, hoping that uh, it won't get reinfected. Uh, an unstable bone after debridement, this is the area where we excise the infected bone. An unstable bone does not respond well to, uh, to treatment. Stability is key to treating bone infection. Dead space where blood accumulates, the hematoma forms which, uh, and becomes the best food for bugs that, that exists, uh, should be addressed. So we use, uh, either bone cement like the one for arthroplasty or absorbable fillers like calcium sulfate, calcium phosphate. And thankfully, we have the technology uh, to uh, impregnate those, those carriers with antibiotics. The good thing about the local antibiotics uh, eluded by, by those, bone, those antibiotic carriers is that the doses are maybe a thousandfold compared to the doses that you would give intravenous, but they're, they're, uh, they're uh, apply only in that area. So even if you have a renal patient who cannot, for example, have gentamicin, you can put gentamicin in the beads and not put the patient at risk because the gentamicin stays there in huge mega doses and will protect you from a reinfection or clear whatever remaining bacteria you couldn't clear with your debridement. And you cannot treat infection if you cannot cover your infected, previously infected area with good soft tissues. This is a photo of an ALT flap, a flap that was taken from the other side thigh with skin, fat, and fascia plumbed into the vessels of the air. So it's a living flap, living tissue that essentially, especially the medial face of the tibia where the skin overlies the bone, you give it the best chance of uh, getting blood supply and recovery. And with this nice plastics photo, I will pass it on to Isabel to talk to us about necrotizing fasciitis. Yeah, I'm it, Isabel. So moving on from the bone side of things, we'll talk briefly about uh, soft tissue infections and in particular necrotizing fasciitis. Um, next slide. Uh, so really there's only three things you need to remember from this talk. Uh, so if you take away three things. So the first one is if you see someone who is unwell, who has redness and pain, a lot of pain in their leg, the first thing that has to spring to your mind is, is this necrotizing fasciitis. Why do you have to be so wary of necrotizing fasciitis? It's because it is a um, potentially fatal surgical emergency. And there actually aren't that many of those. Um, mortality is recorded at kind of 30 to 80%, depending, and it is a real emergency insofar as it progresses over a number of hours. The third thing is given point two, it's quite obvious that you cannot manage this as a single person uh, and you will need to get help um, from a number of different teams. Uh, I think most of you are probably uh, junior registrars, so probably from your consultant, from ITU, from anesthetics, from micro and others, and we'll go through that in the principles. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so first of all, what is necrotizing fasciitis? So there's a broad definition. So it's an aggressive infection that causes necrosis of the fascia, but what actually is a fascia? A fascia is the connective tissue layer that um, wraps around organs and muscles and uh, particularly the deep fascia, that is a real visible structure uh, that you can see, and it's, it's thick. Um, and so what's the difference between a cellulitis and a necrotizing fasciitis? So if you look through the layers of the skin, um, 
know, you can't see my pointer, but if you start at the surface, so if it's very much in the surface, it's just um, erysipelas, but as it goes down, it becomes cellulitis. When it becomes in the deeper layers, uh, in the deep subcutaneous tissue and in the fascia, that's necrotizing fasciitis. What that means is that sometimes you can have a quite what you can have a widespread deep infection with um, much less marked signs on the surface, so a relatively small area of redness, but a really significant deep soft tissue infection underneath. So again, if you see someone with a small area of redness, but they are disproportionately unwell with that, and it's disproportionately painful, it could well be that something is happening deeper below. What you can also see in this slide is that um, these deep layers is where all of those um, uh, blood vessels are, and that's how some of the necrosis happens is through the clotting of those blood vessels, and so the tissue dies. Uh, next slide. So um, because we're doctors or surgeons, we like classifying everything. Uh, so there's a classification for uh, necrotizing fasciitis um, based on the infective organism. So when you first see a patient, you will not know that infective organism. And so um, you have to proceed with the same treatment. So you don't need to remember this and you will only retrospectively be able to actually classify the type of necrotizing fasciitis. The most common is actually a polymicrobial infection with anaerobes um, and aerobes mixed. But whenever you're asked in an exam, uh, the most uh, the thing they always like you to say is that it's a group A um, strep, which is extra aggressive due to the exotoxins. Um, but really, this slide, you can put it to the back of your mind. Uh, next slide. Um, so uh, risk factors. So usually the story of necrotizing fasciitis will start with something pretty indolent. So a surgery, um, an insect bite, any other break in the skin. But often again, there's no story of trauma or any break in the skin. And then you have host factors. And then the host factors are pretty much the host factors that are bad prognostic signs for any condition ever, things that you don't want to have, um, diabetes, HIV, um, being an intravenous drugs user, morbid obesity, cirrhosis, um, uh, and those things. So pretty much the, the list that fits the bill for, for, most, um, for most things. The frequency of necrotizing fasciitis is increasing, and that's probably because there's more people around with these risk factors. Um, there's more multi-resistant organisms around, and some people are saying climate change, yeah. I'll leave you with that thought. <laughs> Next slide, had to get it in there somewhere. Um, uh, so what's the clinical presentation? So you've got the suspicious story at the beginning and then what's the clinical presentation? So the top three things. So um, normally erythema, pain, and they're unwell. So um, erythema, as I said, so you usually get some degree on the surface, but it can be disproportionate to the amount of illness. So sometimes it's quite not very impressive. The pain, though, is really quite impressive. These people are in quite a lot of pain. Um, and that pain is often beyond the redness, really excruciating. Uh, and then the vital signs. So quite often from the literature, pa patients can actually have normal vital signs, although you can also see the classic fever, hypotension, tachycardia, but with normal vital signs, they will just look very unwell. Uh, and if you see them look unwell, don't be fooled by the numbers being okay. Um, if you just click on the slide. Uh, yeah, perfect. So you'll get this progression from erythema into areas of necrosis. So this deep purple bruising, uh, which can then develop into blisters, um, uh, which you'll see there. Um, and this kind of darkish purple discoloration is quite classic. Um, necrotizing fasciitis tends to have really quite rapid progression. Um, and so we're talking over kind of minutes to hours as opposed to days. Uh, and so what's usually the recommended thing to do is when you first go to see the patient, you mark out the extent of the in inflammation. And by the time you finish your investigations, which is usually 30 minutes to an hour later, it will have progressed beyond the borders of your marked area. Not always the case, but um, it's usually a, a good sign. And edema, that's a very non-specific sign, but usually they are really swollen. Uh, next slide. Um, so we've got to the point where you've got a convincing story for necrotizing fasciitis and um, you've got convincing clinical signs. Um, so what do you need to do next? 
Uh, next slide, please. So, of course, go and see the patient. I know that sounds basic, uh, but it's often harder than you think if you just hear, oh, there's an elderly person under the medics with a bit of a red leg. Unless you're thinking about necrotizing fasciitis, it might go to the bottom of your list of priorities, but you do need to put them to the top of your list of priorities. They can be really unwell. And then, of course, you just manage them as per your usual uh, emergency protocol, so A, B, C, D, E. Um, resuscitate them and give antibiotics. Uh, in terms of investigations, um, there's you do bloods, and then that's the main one, and then there are these other um, investigations which you can do. Next slide, please. Um, so on the bloods, you're just looking for the normal picture of a very unwell patient. Uh, we don't need to go through all of them, but of course, raised lactate, um, although that hasn't been shown to be predictive of necrotizing fasciitis, they often do have a raised lactate acidosis. And then um, the rest of this picture that you're all very familiar with as to uh, what a sick patient um, blood size would look like. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, so the Lurinex score is a score that's been devised in order to predict the likelihood of someone having um, necrotizing fasciitis and a score above six is high risk. You can get this on any of the um, MedCalc apps or any other apps that you use. And so again, you don't need to memorize it. Uh, it's slightly controversial. Some people um, think it's great and others don't. There's been a pretty large um, meta-analysis done um, in 2018, which again was kind of inconclusive as to how useful it is. Um, so use your clinical judgment was the outcome of that. Uh, next slide. Um, if you really are not sure and you, you really want something more definitive to decide whether this patient needs to go to theatre urgently, uh, you can proceed to what's called the finger test. So you put a little bleb of local anaesthetic into the patient, make a stab, go down to the fascia. Um, classically, um, you find this uh, dishwater coloured uh, fascia um, and fluid and it's foul smelling and the tissues will look unhealthy and dissect away easily. Um, but oh, only required if you're not sure. Radiological investigations, again, um, mainly if you're not sure. If you're sure and it's barn door, you don't always need to get them, but in reality, often we do get them. Uh, usually we get CT because it's because of availability reasons, it's the fastest to get, um, but really that shouldn't delay getting this patient to theatre. As you can see, there are some um, signs such as gas in the tissues, et cetera, that you can see. Um, so once you're sure that um, the you're pretty sure this is necrotizing fasciitis. You've got the story, you've got the examination, you've got the investigations, and you really think this is all pointing in the same direction. What do you need to do next? Um, so this is the point uh, you really need to get some help uh, because you know that this patient is very unwell and also unstable and likely to deteriorate quickly. Um, so you'll need help from the anesthetists um, to st help stabilize the patient medically. Um, you'll likely need someone to help you in theatre. These are big, messy, bloody operations. Um, ITU, where they're probably going to go afterwards. Um, microbiology, you, they're usually not on site. So if you do want an urgent gram stain intraoperatively, which is the gold standard, although um, not always available, then uh, you need to get them uh, in. And um, if you have plastic surgeons on site, uh, we're usually happy to be called, but I think most orthopedic units wouldn't have plastic surgery necessarily on site. So the first debridement would be your responsibility because they won't accept the transfer of such a sick patient because it would just be an unacceptable delay to the debridement. Um, neck fash, uh, sorry, next slide, neck fash. So the debridement. Um, like any debridement, you've got to remove all the dead tissue, which sounds very easy in, princ in principle. It's actually doing a good debridement is an incredibly difficult surgical skill, actually, that's really um, undervalued. Um, but you really have to make sure that you have um, got all the dead tissue in order to stop the patient being so sick. When it's caught early, by definition, it's in the fascia. So the underlying muscle um, should be OK. Uh, if it's progressed further, there can be necrosis and sometimes extensive necrosis of the underlying muscle. Um, when you are doing the debridement, the edema and infection can generally make the anatomy very distorted. 
So if you are going beneath the fascia, just remember that's where all the important stuff is normally. Uh, so the nerves and all that stuff. So if you can not, not go through them, obviously sometimes you can't and you're saving a patient's life, but as soon as you're through the fascia, you do have to just start thinking, okay, well, anatomically, what's gonna be near here um, to recognize it. Um, uh, yep, yeah, so this was this is a patient actually post uh, grafting just to show how extensive the debridement after a necrotizing fasciitis can be. Uh, he's lost his entire interior compartment. Some of the areas have been grafted. He then subsequently had more um, muscle die back uh, and he had to be divided again. And you can see his patella tendon's gone. He's got an open joint. Um, uh, once you finish your debridement, um, normal dressing, so it would be betadine, curlix, and a vac. And then these patients usually have a, one but often multiple multiple returns to theater to make sure that you have uh, cleared all of the infective tissue um, and to keep them well and then um, once you have the big hole uh, you call the plastic surgeons to sort it out for you um, I think uh, so and then the last slide is just kind of recapping on the top messages at the top which was just don't forget about it uh, it's really um, and get help when you do think you have got neck fash. Um, so I think back to Alex, who's going to do a case who's going to, that's going to tie all of these things together. So let me quickly take you through a case. That was a 35-year-old fit and healthy because he fell climbing the rocks in the Dolomites, had an open tibia fracture that was nailed and closed uh, in the same setting. And three weeks later, he came to us uh, looking like this with a hole pass coming out where the previous wound was and x-ray looked like this now you have a suspicion of a sequestrum here you see the color of this bone is different than this so high suspicion of a sequestrum especially when you know that this bone had been exposed uh, i won't comment on the quality of the nailing but you know that there's metal work in a bone that's probably infected you're aggressive you excise the healthy tissue. We extended the, in every debridement in the leg, every incision is extended to the fasciotomy lines. That's a drawing here. That's the fasciotomy line. This is the bone. You never extend this way because it's impossible to close. You extend to the fasciotomy lines and you can see the posterior compartment here. Remove all the dead bone, ream the canal, remove the metalwork, you can see the little pieces of dead bone removed and the amount of dead bone and all the metalwork is out. And after that, robust of tissue coverage, as we said from the principles and stability. We put a temporary X fix just to plan for the next stage. So when we know we have debrided well, we've taken samples to know what's causing the infection. We've stabilized the bone so the patient is safe. The soft tissues a couple of days later look robust. So then we can plan for definitive treatment, essentially what we do with the bone that we've lost and how do we give the patient his function back. It's not just about clearing the infection, the leg has to work again. So you have to restore the lost bone. In this case, we acutely shortened the bone uh, at uh, the area of debridement. So there's no bone gap, but now the leg is very short. So we've done an osteotomy approximately and we use this complex double stack frame to, uh, to lengthen the bone from the top, from the healthy area and restore the length. And in the end, get a tibia. You can see how much we shortened by the shortening of the fibula here. And this is the length we got back that you can see up there in the, in the final x-rays. So the patient essentially has ended up with a healthy leg a bit oversized but healthy and fully functional um, quickly go to the take-home messages always suspect the infection uh, when you see the signs that we described swelling erythema but draining sinus always remember that staph aureus is, is is the most common pathogen in all categories you can have as many people answered salmonella is pathognomonic um, for sickle cell patients it's pathognomonic. So if you have salmonella, you know that's probably a sickle. Still, staph aureus is the most common one, though. MRI is the most diagnostic imaging modality. You have to use all of them, though, to or some of them to, to conclude. 
Uh, remember the surgical principles, good debridement and sampling, removal of everything that's dead or infected, um, a proper sampling, dead space management, uh, antibiotic treatment, stability, and robust soft tissue coverage. Necrotizing fasciitis is a surgical emergency, is the plastics equivalent of our compartment syndrome. Uh, and always ask for help. You need help from seniors of your specialty as well as other specialties, like the list of, of, of specialties we described be, uh, beyond, uh, before. Uh, I want to quickly go to the chat because there were a few questions and I, I look into uh, answering them quickly before we go to, to the football. So, uh, sorry, let me get there. The so can, I, can I just, um, I was looking through the questions as well and uh, Bilal is uh, asking about the management of osteomyelitis in uh, underdeveloped countries, as he says, with less resources. Um, and I think this is a massive challenge. Um, you know, infection is in itself a very costly uh, thing to deal with, even within, you know, the NHS, which is probably sits very, very high when it comes to healthcare systems. Management of infection is not easy because it costs a lot of money to the trust, right? So, you know, it's very difficult to demonstrate what are the benefits of these, but, you know, even within the NHS, you suffer with your resources, let alone when you're somewhere else. I think the most important thing that, you know, because all of us are very interested, uh, not just in the management of infection, but we're all quite interested in sort of training and developing these services in other countries and offering help. I think one very important thing is to have... Um, people who are really familiar with what they're doing and people who are willing to ask for support early. And I think developing networks in the first instance is a great approach towards this for people to standardize their treatments. Also remember your principles. You can always not reach 100% of debridement, soft tissue coverage, uh, optimizing the patient, but you have to aim for 100% in every one of the four principles of treating bone infection. Get as much as possible. Um, so uh, how do you clinically differentiate be between the different syndromes? I think that uh, Easy Stock uh, has given us, has shed some light on this. Um, you differentiate neck fash is an emergency it's not just a soft tissue edema the patient has excruciating pain it resembles more compartment syndrome but you have an area of erythema you have suspicion of infection so suspicion of infect of soft tissue infection with out of proportion pain should raise suspicion for neck fash um are you then it can it can be difficult though some people can have a very bad leg cellulitis and um and it is difficult to tell. Um, and as you saw, it, it is kind of, uh, it's a continuum in so far as a very deep cellulitis. Where does that change into becoming an ectizing fasciitis? I think it's how unwell the patient is. The speed of progression is the main things. And if you're worried, then act as if it's an ectizing fasciitis, particularly, for example, if you do the finger test, you will be physically looking at the fascia. That's a small stab incision, minimal mor morbidity for the patient. You look at the fascia. If if the fascia and the deep tissues are okay, you're very much reassured. But you, it, it, it can be incredibly difficult because you can have people with a, if severe cellulitis, very raised inflammatory markers who are very sick, where it is hard to tell. And the only way to tell is literally surgically making a stab and looking at the fascia. Yeah. So there will not always be a sinus and visible pus, but if it's not an emergency, the way to differentiate osteomyelitis from cellulitis or erythema, if it's not an emergency, if it's not neck fascia, it's basically your imaging that will tell you, as well as the history, the history of uh, internal fixation of an open fracture of a patient having a previous sinus of an infection a few years ago that's now flared up. So yeah, it's the clinical signs, the history, and mainly the imaging that will help you. Uh, with regards to the lengthening of the tibia, it's not urgent. You can be sure that you've cleared the infection. You can start your lengthening four, six, eight weeks after your initial debridement and stabilization. Um, 
again, with regards to what Ed is asking, Ed, this is, uh, you know, this is all part of what we call distraction osteogenesis, which is a big part of what we do in limb reconstruction. But essentially, it's not just osteogenesis, it's tissue genesis. So all tissues lengthen. Of course, throughout the period of lengthening, depending again on your resources and your contact with patients, you have to put them through intense physiotherapy. And very often you find that that fails even within our setups and that for subsequently you may have to do uh, sort of soft tissue procedures to address that. But in the context of what you're trying to achieve, this is uh, certainly something that's kind of uh, worth, uh, you know, undertaking. Uh, so, yeah, and if you don't identify the pathogen, I'm answering the last question, uh, you have to give broad spectrum antibiotics, or if it's a relapse recurrence of previous infection, you can base your treatment on the previous bugs. That's not always correct because the, we know that the, the local flora changes with time in chronic osteomyelitis, but broad spectrum is the solution if you don't have an answer, aggressive debridement as well. And uh, that's where you need your microbiologists. I think that uh, it's time for football now, right? Uh, thank you very much um, to our speakers. Thank you very much for a brilliant presentation. Thank you, Mr. Riss, Mr. Eliadis and Ms. Citron. And thank you very much to our sponsors, Leader and RCS. Uh, the feedback form you can now fill out. I'll put the link up. And I think it's football time. Just to let you know, the registration form for next week will be released via social media. Um, and it will be Mr. Bates again on basic fracture fixation. And I'm just trying to get back on this. There we go. I think you should be able to see the feedback link. Um, and that's it. And the recording for this will be released in a few days. So please do look out for that via Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank Thanks you. Thanks for coming, guys. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Thank you.